Hello Slap, and I'm a watchmaker here in <laughs> Switzerland at <laughs> this time. <laughs> uh, we are live from Le Locle and, uh, in Switzerland, and it's uh, Hendrik Korpelaas, uh, KHWCC uh, watchmaking school. And we're going to do a tour, and we are going to meet Hendrik, and maybe if we can show you this. There is Ewout, Hendrik and Edwin, and in a moment I will be uh, introducing uh, them to you. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Ewout is uh, seeing if we can get the uh, live, and then there yeah. is the top chat, but all the chat. <laughs> there, we there we go. Hey, and already we see uh, Claire Lee, of course, Thomas, John, Jay Woody, Tony, well, Zoltan from uh, Hungary. Hi there. Lex van Bakel, helemaal gezellig. En Herman. Greetings from Portugal. Yeah. And uh, we do have some coffee. Hmm. What we're going to do, uh, we do going to have some fun. I'll be showing you around uh, the watchmaking school here. And um, Ewout is sitting there writing down your questions. And if, hey Theo, wat leuk. Nu begrijp je ook waarom de IWC nog niet af is. <laughs> um, oh, oh, omega, ja klopt, omega. <laughs> um, Lisa, Lisa. <laughs> hey wat leuk dat je erbij bent. Um, I'll be showing you around the watchmaking school here, um, show you a bit of the, the machines being used. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And Ewout is going to write them down. And uh, you'll be able to ask Hendrik anything or myself. And uh, yeah. So what are we dealing with? It's a watchmaking school. It's a privately owned watchmaking school. And it is really high level. And just to show you around, this is the machine room. Hey, uh, Jean, Switzerland is excellent. Um, just a small, the, the small introduction. The house or jig borer with digital readout. Hey, from Argentina. Gonzalo, very nice that you're here. De Omega die komt zeker weer binnenkort bij kennis, uh, Theo. Dat komt absoluut goed. Uh, beautiful Houser. Uh, Asiera. And we are going to use this one uh, probably tomorrow to make uh, Geneva stripes go to Geneva. Uh, the lovely Chamblain 102. We have the same. Another 102. Uh, Agaton. And here the pantograph, Leonard. So, um, Hendrik just, oh, first things first. Just for butter coffee. Huh. <laughs> Hendrik just told me he's been here for 20 years and with loads of experience. So if you have any questions about watchmaking, about watchmaking school, how to uh, start in your pro profession, how to uh, gain knowledge in the profession, uh, he's the guy to ask. Hmm? I'm not going to bring the coffee uh, to the workbenches. <laughs> cool. So there we go. Um, um, this is workshop one with a beautiful profile projector. Um, here do we sit and um, we are here for a course in finishing for Côte de Geneve, uh, Geneva stripes, uh, anglage, the beveling, uh, perlage, the small, uh, what is it, pointage? 
the small spots. And uh, what else do we have? Well, a black polishing, of course, of the uh, screw heads and a blockage, um, uh, black polish of parts, but then black polish to the next level. Uh, not make it shiny, but way beyond that. Um, a real eye-opener for us. Uh, it's so nice to, work, to, uh, to gain the knowledge and uh, to have fun with, uh, uh, with, with Hendrik. Uh, I see some questions coming in, so that is very nice. Um, Ewout is uh, sitting here um, behind the laptop. And um, he's writing down your questions. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Deep space polish, that's it. Well, the stunning um, Chablain 70. We've got the, 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 the older model, but this with all the tools and the frequency controller and um, the real nice stuff. So I've been here, I think, three years ago for a restoration course. Uh, had so much fun with Owen and with uh, um, Richard. And uh, <laughs> Hendrik remembered with uh, Svenja, yeah, you were here three years ago with that, uh, <laughs> with those whiskey guys. <laughs> well, they were right. <laughs> so uh, we left an impression. <laughs> Uh, this is the other workshop. Here is where the students are who are uh, working on watches, who are doing the, the two-year training, the 4,000 hours. And, well, I'm not going to touch what they're working on. But maybe we can secretly show without touching anything Now I'm holding a, a, a loop for the lens. And now we can see the parts that they're working on with the zinc block and all the tools. Um, not able to show, but maybe just to hear, are the cows across the field. Uh, maybe you saw us running in the, the Switzerland incident. The Switzerland incident. Uh, the cows with the bells. The full Swiss uh, uh, experience, that is. Uh, they are working on the finishing. There is the pellet fork. Did anybody just say pellet fork. There it is. In the movement, I'm not going to lift the bell, but uh, as you can see, they did a hand. Uh, hey, Danny, good to see you from Denmark. So, hey, Rien and Blenny and John, uh, I see your question. Um, Ewout is going to write them down, and uh, I think it's time to meet Henrik. Well, there we go. Gaat het goed, Ewout? Ja, nee, ik maak foto's van de vragen. Ja, oké. Nou, perfect. Well, the man, the myth, it's Henrik. Hello. <laughs> um, well, Henrik Korpela. Uh, we've met, I think three years ago. Yep. He's the owner of the uh, watchmaking school. And I understand that you came here about in Switzerland about 20 years ago? Uh, yeah, in Switzerland, yes, in uh, 20 years ago. So um, how did you start your watchmaking career? Uh, I started it in uh, Sweden about 1995. Um, yeah, 1995, graduated 1998, and got a job there, which mm -hmm. I stayed in three years. Oh, okay. In Sweden. So that was my education, basically. And what made you le uh, make uh, leave Sweden and come to here? Uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to explore more. I was young, and uh, it wasn't enough. 
uh, to restore and repair watches. And, um, and then I actually applied first to go to America. Okay. Uh, I wanted to first go to America to learn their style of watchmaking and so on. And then later go to uh, Switzerland and hopefully be uh, accepted by Boste. Yeah. But where I applied, it, they said that it was basically impossible at that time to, to get a visa. Okay, so they referred me further yeah. uh, to a company in Zurich. Okay. Where they, uh, where they actually, uh, where they made the American after sales service for yeah. that brand, and then uh, they recommended me there, and then I applied there, and I got in there and started to work in Zurich. But you, uh, you taught in America as well. Yeah, but much later. Oh, okay. That's uh, that's even after my experience in Vostep. That's probably started in around 2015, 2016. I, I got my first experience to uh, give. Uh, short uh, two-day or uh, one-week classes. Ah, let me see, take it over. Maybe we can sit down and... Yeah, sure. uh, so, yeah, we'll see if. Oh. Get together, there we go. Um, Ewout, do you have uh, a question coming in? Well. <laughs> <laughs> It'll fix anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. uh, quite a few. Uh, I've seen quite a few questions about uh, the different programs. So yeah, it's it's program Can you a brokerage audio copy for your for the bank? Program. Yeah. Uh, apart from uh, the length. What is the difference yeah. between the program, uh, also uh, costs about the program? Perfect, thank you. Uh, I've seen questions. Uh, you also provide uh, online training, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, I don't do... I've been thinking for some time about the online uh, training, but it never really came into fruition. I didn't really get far with it, uh, but I'm always thinking about it, but it doesn't seem so easy uh, to do. Uh, actually, it's more the problem uh, of time. Uh, I don't have so much time left uh, to do it since I'm the only one teaching here. Okay. And for the eight months program, it's uh, the eight months technician program is actually um, on extract from the, the full skill two-year course. So it's the final part, which does not include really the micromechanical part. So it's more the watch servicing and repairing and replacing parts, which is also uh, uh, very needed today. So it's basically 33% of the two-year course. Oh, okay, yeah. But uh, um, this is like, um a two-year course uh, and the full range of watchmaking. Yeah, um, whatever is possible to compress into it, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Um, and the courses you give is a bit like a finishing school, like for ex experienced watchmakers uh, to go to the next level, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's part of that, I would say, is true. Mm. Or somebody who... Who really have the, um, who really wanna uh, learn something very deeply, yeah, and intensively because the course is uh, rather intensive, and who want to get the maximum watchmaking experience within the two years, yeah, and it could be for somebody who wants to uh, complete also a watchmaking education that was maybe spread out in many many courses but it was never consolidated into one yeah. clean course where you, you have most of the, the important elements on an intensive level. Yeah. I just saw a, a question come by um, about what's the, for you, the most uh, uh, challenging complication to work on because you've got so much experience. Uh, it's not really any I wouldn't say it's anything specific to a complication or something like this. It's probably then 
it could be just a certain mechanism that is uh, yeah. uh, really hard to work with. And it, it, it can even be a, a simple watch can be very complicated actually to restore. So I wouldn't say that it's specific for uh, some complication that is harder than another complication. Yes, the minute repeater, there is, uh, it takes a long time to make everything right, I would say. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I'm quite a generalist. I don't think of anything specific. Maybe some uh, some uh, watch movement that has its own uh, problematic characteristic can be hard. Yeah. But I can't think of anything uh, uh, special really that comes to mind. Yeah, that's what I love about uh, this watchmaking school. Um, as you just could see with the, the introduction in the different, uh, in the machine room and stuff, um, you really learn how to control uh, the machines and machining, make parts yourself. So, um, just about any complication and any part you can make yourself, you understand the function, you understand what it's doing, and you can uh, replicate the original one. So anything you uh, uh, come by, uh, you can restore it then. And what we did with the uh, restoration, especially today, uh, with the finishing techniques, is discussing the f different finishing techniques in different periods of time. Because, well, like Hendrik said, um, if you make a watch part and it's complete shiny and new and beautiful and perfect and you put it in a uh, 1930s movement and it just springs out and it doesn't blend in with the original, uh, is it really restoration? And it's uh, more, um, uh, well, you have to think about that anyway. And you have to be able to replicate uh, different finishing techniques from different uh, periods. Um, um, yeah, is there any question? Yeah, uh, what course would you recommend after uh, what's that 3000 hour course with a focus on finishing? Uh, that's why I'm offering this course, yeah. this course that you're taking here now. And it is, that's what I had in mind I would, uh, of course, wish that it would be longer, because uh, three weeks goes so uh, one week goes in in absolutely no time, <laughs> and we're just trying to cover everything um, I can do for now, uh, because I have the two-year course, uh, and I'm the only teacher at the moment, so I don't have too much time. But when I offer that finishing course, yeah. Unless you could also go, perhaps also uh, other schools in the future may offer it as well. Maybe BHI, AWCI, WASTEP. But I don't know at the moment if they have uh, uh, finishing uh, specialized finishing classes. Yeah. But this is the best I can do now this one week. And it's interesting. And it is very, very <laughs> and challenging. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you've been doing this for, for many years. Um, where are the students coming from? Is that just random, globally, just all around the world? Because last time I was here, and maybe it's just a coincidence, there were some uh, Taiwanese students. Uh, I remember yeah, CJ, yeah. and we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, can you tell a thing uh, about that? Where the yeah, coming yeah. From? so uh, there is some sort of a trend now I see, and it's Almost, I think almost every class I had some, at least one Taiwanese, I yeah. think. So that's, that has been quite often. Uh, once in a while, uh, some Canadians and um, more American applicants in the, in the last year. But that could have been because I, they promoted me a lot when I went to America. So that's probably an effect of that. And then apart from that, I don't see any special trend. Then it's, it can just be anybody from any country. Yeah. But are there enough job openings for uh, students uh, who being here for years, uh, can control machines, know what they're doing, uh, are excellent watchmakers? Um, are there any watchmakers needed? What, what you, are your views on that? Oh, I think uh, certainly uh, watchmaking seems to still be growing despite this uh, uh, virus situation. It doesn't seem to 
have been really that badly um, um, harmed by it. And uh, I actually I saw a lot of new independents. It seems I'm actually it's so many independents coming out now. I'm completely overwhelmed. <laughs> I true. cannot keep any track <laughs> anymore. I just lost count. And they all do uh, very, very uh, uh, amazing things. Because I remember I started as a young student in 1995. So this is just tremendous what I'm uh, seeing today. And uh, all my students always get jobs uh, so far. And I don't see that trend to uh, change. I think it's strange because uh, I did a, um, a training at Vostep and they had all the ex-students uh, there. And you mentioned you started in 1995. That must have been a magical year, because at that time, I think Groenefeld was there. Uh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a misunderstanding. I don't want to make this misunderstanding again. Uh, 1995, it was the Swedish school. Yeah, I know, Swedish. I know. And but 2004 was Vostep. But people who started uh, uh, de ah, developing I their see. skills at that time. I see, yeah. Um, and... Spe that especially at, at that time, mechanical watchmaking wasn't that cool to do. It that wasn't that true. wasn't a sexy yeah. profession. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it was a real start of really driven, inspired people yeah. uh, who are controlling <laughs> the watchmaking uh, world today. <laughs> That's uh, that is true that I didn't think too much about. But yeah, yeah. That is uh, that is very uh, quite clearly how it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, strange but true. Do, do you have any views on uh, innovation in watchmaking? What can we expect for uh, the the not to the, the, the near future? Um, so I guess the last kind of uh, serious innovation in in watchmaking. Because I, I think uh, more like very generally about mm -hmm. watchmaking because I have to also teach. I can't just teach one specific thing since I'm teaching classical watchmaking. So it will always be, uh, uh, for me, I will teach like beveling, uh, frosting, how to make handmade parts. That it's, There is not much change there. Yeah. Uh, and the latest big change that uh, I noticed started maybe already 20, uh, 15, 20 years ago or even earlier was the silicon. Yeah. So that was a, a big thing that came in. And now many brands have, uh, whether people like them or not, that I don't know. But that's, uh, uh, yeah, it's the late. So it has to do with material science was the latest technological uh, big thing, I think, that happened. Um, and uh, is there any other? And then uh, future trends. Ooh, that is that is very. It, it seems to actually go then backwards for me. What I see because of all this independence. Yeah. They don't seem to use that much of these high technology materials. Really it seems traditional. Very traditional. Yeah. Perhaps that's the new technology. It's the Stone Age technology. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, that's the trend looking forward now. That. People really want to uh, make more individual products uh, or more, uh, or they want to actually add, uh, I think, uh, value to the watch and not only by material uh, yeah. or necessarily by science, but some hands on uh, kind of uh, uh, where people can relate because it's not easy to relate to like high technological material. How do you do that? But a uh, collector perhaps can relate to, you know, somebody who is making something manually and mm -hmm. polishing by rubbing something. And I think that's a trend that is going now in the, the uh, big trend going in yeah. the future. But we do need a new escapement, don't you think? New, uh, that, there was a, a, such a trend also mm. in the past. And then I noticed many, many brands, even independents, started to experiment. And that was kind of a funny period and probably will still continue with new escapement. I think that's also uh, quite interesting. But it, I guess it's only so much we can invent in terms of mechanical things. Uh, because many uh, escapements were already invented and experimented with. Yeah. And uh, yeah. proven, yeah, yeah, proven. Uh, oh, oh yeah. somebody mentioned uh, diamond gears. 
Oh, okay. I did not hear about that, but uh, diamond gear. Uh, I have heard, yes, about silicon uh, wheels that have been diamond coated. I think one brand did oh, it here. Okay. Diamond coated uh, silicon. So that's possible. Or 3D printed parts. Do and uh, um, at the moment, I know some who made clocks clocks but they say that it's still very very hard to make small parts 3d printed but then there was a guy who made metal cases 3d printed uh, also very successfully yeah. so i think it's something constantly in development and maybe it will be it will certainly be some part uh, and we i think we will use it more in the on, future on a personal note uh, what we have done is uh, made a drawing on a profile projector uh, yeah convert the drawing to uh, 3D, uh, like Fusion 360, yeah, and uh, then print it out um, like 20 times bigger, and then on the pantograph you can use it to uh, cut oh, it out. Oh, and, and th that's great! That's for, great creative for, use. Yeah, and that, yeah. that worked perfectly. It's, uh, I think uh, yeah, we should just see at all the technology we have around us. How can we use that in classical watchmaking yeah. and uh, restoration? Because our time is always becoming more and more expensive, yeah. more and more valuable the more we uh, develop in society. And sometimes it could be beneficial, maybe even if we could get down the time with technology and 3D printing, maybe laser cutters and these kind of things mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, and in the end, you probably anyway want to add some value after you have made that component, whether if it was manually made in a yeah. lathe or something or by a laser, by the finishing. And that, I think, creates some extra value to the, the the pieces or the pieces you're restoring that it was a human being who actually were thinking about the piece and, and repairing it yeah uh, i see a question coming in uh, about the coaxial oh, sorry, sorry the coaxial escapement um it was a huge uh, innovation at the time uh, then there were some problems with lubrication you yeah. have a huge amount of lubrication um, is it worth it to invest time and money and effort in uh, innovation while there is already so much being done? So um, is the traditional way of doing uh, indeed the next, uh, the next step? So they're taking a step back instead of innovation with new materials and trying to make a new escapement. That's not really a question, but it is. Um, um, what is your, your your vision for the for the coaxial then? Um, I think it's. Um, I think the most important thing is that first we have to ask ourselves why are we buying these things that we absolutely don't need. <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that the most important thing to keep in mind is that there was a man who dedicated a large large portion of his life. Trying to improve uh, the Swiss lever escapement by making a new one. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is astonishing. That's true. And for, there are also car engines that people try to do make better and better and better, but then they never took off. But today they are really nice collector objects, for example. Oh, and I think yeah. it's the same. It's maybe it's not better uh, but it's still very very interesting yeah true um but and i i haven't worked enough uh, i have no statistics uh, to know it, it maybe it is much better than the swiss lever i yeah, can't true. say that actually yeah. um perhaps uh, uh, i guess the the ones who have uh, sold thousands of those would would know in then but but even if it isn't better it's still extremely interesting. Right? It is, yeah. And the knowledge sharing he did, uh, trying to keep uh, the standard high in yeah. watchmaking. Uh, don't forget about the tradition. Uh, know your past so you can see into the future. Uh, yeah, that's really inspiring. Spring drive was another... Uh, oh, yeah. Psycho spring drive. Yeah, that's just... Also just very cool. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Very serious as well. Yeah. 
Is there one question that came uh, came out that a lot of people want to know, or mm. because I think it's just about being finished? Well, uh, there was one uh, uh, that was on the topic of uh, the, the the training courses. Um, your thoughts on um, if you. Uh, discover that you're into watchmaking at an earlier age. Somebody was mentioning I'm 41 years old. Yeah. Uh, is, is that still a problem, you think? Or is, is, is maybe watchmaking an excellent opportunity for a career switch? Ah, now that's an well, excellent question. Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. Um, so we have a few minutes left. <laughs> yes. yeah, sorry, the mechanical <laughs> clock is not on time here. Um, very great uh, question, actually. So I have had students younger even than 20, very young, but the youngest I usually have are around 20, 25. Yeah. And I started watchmaking school when I was 16. Ah. And that's a terrible idea normally yeah. because it's a small chance that um, uh, that yeah I mean we started 30 students and uh, not everybody graduated let me say like that it was uh, and and a few were worked as watchmakers after because when you're that young I'm not sure you know 100% uh, what you want to do so so probably the youngest today start when they're 20, 25. And then I had students yeah. who are in their 30s. I had uh, students in their 40s. I also have a student who is over 60 at the moment. So um, it doesn't seem to be too important the age uh, no. for watchmaking, I have noticed. I started when I was uh, in my 30s and uh I don't think I could concentrate enough when I was in my early 20s because my brain was just going everywhere. Uh, the question was about uh, starting watchmaking. Uh, do you really have to start on an early age or is there uh, still hope when uh, your beard got yeah, <laughs> different colors suddenly? Don't, there is the right, <laughs> I would say there's the right time. Some people need yeah. 40 years to find out that this is what they want to do. And uh, that's not uh, old today, 40 years. Um, uh, and today we could almost say that starting at 30 is quite young. Well, what I can imagine though is um, if you start at a later age, it's maybe more difficult to get a job uh, if you want to work for uh, one of the, 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 the big brands. If you want to start for yourself, then who can, I mean, it's your own decision. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's no problem. But uh, I can imagine that uh, one of the big brands, they would probably uh, hire a younger person, uh, more likely to hire a younger person over one that is 45, 50 years old or so. I'm not sure there is such a correlation direct. Uh, I think no. it, it totally depends on, on the situation of all these hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not, uh, there is some advantages to hire the young person because then they can pay less salary. Uh, if it's older, then they usually would have to pay more salary, mm -hmm. but they, maybe they also may f feel that if it's an older, it's a person who, who may be more <laughs> mature as well. Uh, so I'm not really sure that it would be, if it's harder, I'm not sure it's much harder uh, if you graduate later. Yeah. It's funny that uh, now I see uh, people are coming in. I started at 73, 72, 60. I'm 48 now, 57. So the audience is uh, at least uh, over 40, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, yeah. on average in, in, in this stream. Yeah. Plus, we also live much healthier today, so you can be a watchmaker for quite some time. There are even even uh, watchmakers who are in the 70s and still work, 70s and 80s yeah. still yeah. working professionally. Yeah. So, And if you start uh, want to start uh, independently and start your own workshop, it's a huge investment. And I really can understand that uh, younger people uh, are not able to put up the money for machining, yeah, tooling, yeah, because yeah. there's no end right. <laughs> in investment. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Millions of tools is what we... Millions yeah, of yeah. tools and then a few yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think that's about it. Um, 
I really enjoyed it. Um, if there are any more uh, questions, please put them in the uh, in the comments, um, and I'll uh, make sure you'll get an answer uh, anyway. Uh, many thanks to Ewout and Edwin, because after a very long day, screw polishing and black polish and uh, beveling, uh, they're still here. Thank you so much for uh, Hendrik. Uh, it's been a long day and I really, really enjoyed uh, the stream here. So thank you all for watching. Uh, if you have any comments, any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, Granoglide and sit back and relax and uh, please enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. See ya. Bye bye.